Welcome to Creators Cafe. I'm your host, Jessica Payne. I'm a performer, performance coach, and multi-hyphenate creator. I'm going to be bringing you conversations with some of my favorite creators where we talk about the sublime and the specifics of the creative journey. So grab a drink, get cozy. Let's go. My guest, Maggie Zabo, is a recording artist and songwriter. Maggie comes from Canada, but is based in Los Angeles, and she is a multi-platinum, two-time Billboard number one songwriter. She's also an amazing artist in her own right. She's released a series of high-profile singles, remixes, and EPs that put her on the map as a pop artist and change maker. Maggie has over 30 million streams on Spotify, 13 million views on YouTube, and more than 50 notable placements in film and TV. We're talking E, Disney, ABC, NBC, and Netflix. Maggie also has a hugely successful songwriting career. Her song Slow Mo reached number one on the Billboard charts in Spain in 2022, and the artist Chanel, who sings it, took it to Eurovision and got third place with Maggie's song in Eurovision. That's huge. Maggie wrote a song with the K-pop group La Seraphim, which hit number one on the Billboard World Albums chart. She also wrote on their album Unforgiven, which accumulated one million copies sold on the first day of its release. Please enjoy my conversation with the incredible artist Maggie Zabo. Welcome to Creators Cafe, Maggie Zabo. Thanks for having me. Yay! How's it going? Really good. I'm so glad you're here. This is fun. Me too. It's good and to be here. It's good to like uh, get to know you better too. In person, and, yeah. Hanging out. It's nice. Yeah. Relaxed. Yes. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, so, what are you drinking today? This is just some unsweetened iced tea, and I put a little Splenda in there for fun. So, you know. <laughs> You're pretty crazy. Yeah, I know. We're wild. What are you drinking? Uh, I have an iced latte. So okay. my mine's from Andante, which is a really good, okay. um, like local coffee roaster, which okay. I like. Okay. But they don't have black iced tea, so I went right next door to. Okay. Like the next block over is Hot Mess, so it's like hot Ooh, mess. Okay, um, and it's a French cafe, and okay. it's it's tiny, but it's really cute. That's what I love about LA. Is there's so many? Like I have never been there. Yeah, and I've lived here for years. Right, and you've like it's and on I Beverly. Live you've like passed a mile. it. Yeah, so there's always something to check out around here, which is nice. Yeah, and that I like using this as an excuse of like, yeah. well, I've got to go find some new places. Totally, and totally, it's business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all a write off. Yeah, it's fine. exactly. <laughs> um, so how do you? think of yourself as a creator? I think of myself, I would define myself as a recording artist and a songwriter. Great. Yeah. How did you get into the recording artist path? Because I think a lot of people go into the singing path and, and intend to be solo performers. And then what happens next is always interesting. Was that your path or did you do something else? That's a good question. Cause I, I guess when you say there is a difference between a recording artist and a vocalist, let's say. Um, And I guess you can define that however you want. For me, it's more like um, I release music. I am an artist in that sense where I put music out um, under under my name. And so that's kind of what I would define as a recording artist for me. Um, And I have been doing that ever since I was like three years old. I knew I wanted to sing. I grew up. In a small town called Dundas in Ontario, Canada. Um, And singing and dance and music was always just the biggest part of my life. And I kind of knew at that age, like, that's what I was meant to do. So I started going into singing lessons when I was, like, seven or eight. I begged my parents to, like, help me figure out what the heck I was doing. Um, So I started seeing different vocal coaches, and then I started going into classical training. Mm -hmm. Even though I knew I wanted to sing pop for myself, I was trying to learn a lot of, like, the basics and the fundamentals and, like, a good foundation for being a singer. So I trained a lot with, like, a different classical vocal teachers, and I studied, and then that was kind of my basis. And then from there, I started going into writing songs and figuring out how to like make my own music. I love that. Um, I so I am probably a singer first out of all of the things okay. that I do, That's like cool. at least time wise. But also like it, that was my first artistic love, okay. no question. I love that. I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And so I like I've you know. I, 
toured with musicals and done a lot of music so directing and singing. One. So that from the from the beginning that was number one, and then it swung more to the okay. acting side. But it's that was such kind a good of foundation for everything. Yeah, um, it's a really good foundation. And I I started with classical training, but that okay. kind of wasn't what I wanted to yeah. do. But I that was all of my training. Yeah. What did you like? Have training to get to the pop side or mm-hmm. did you um just find your sound or did yeah. you like find artists that you wanted to mimic because I I, f- I think for me I went to like from classical to more modern stuff and contemporary and then I was able to get to um like uh belt and yeah. more modern like kind of rock sounds okay. but I've never I have never achieved a consistent pop sound mm-hmm. so uh, this is just a selfish question That's what, a good what question. do you what do you recommend for somebody a who's like trying to find the pop that. sound I feel like it's such a good question I feel so strongly about it because yeah. I had so many vocal coaches growing up for different parts of my voice And I always will tell people classical training for a foundation is the most important. Yeah. I I never, I I always knew I was going to go in a pop direction and I never, I was obviously like never feeling like I wanted to be like an opera singer. Yeah. But my vocal coach, Marta Greta Kaizek, I still remember her. Mm. She was this Polish opera singer. And I was, before I met her, I was training with some like pop vocal coaches, more on that side of things. And maybe it was just my voice. I had a lot of, like, certain bad habits with my voice. I was pitchy. I was doing certain things wrong. My technique wasn't great. Um, And so that's kind of when I discovered, okay, maybe I should just start at the fundamentals, Mm -hmm. classical training. I learned how to sight read. I did my certain classical exams. And it never came natural to me. It was, like, hilarious, like, me trying to sing you know, these Italian opera songs. It sounded <laughs> hilarious on my voice. Yeah. Because I do all think we're born with a, with a specific quality and style to our voice. Like, yeah. that is something you're born with. It's like how you look. You can't really change it yeah. to a certain extent. But, of course, you can train your control and your pitch and, and obviously make the quality of it better. And for me, I just always had more of, like, a little bit of a different pop voice. Um, But that classical training really helped me as far as my pitch Mm -hmm. and and my technique and how, like, my voice placement. And still to this day, like, I feel like I'm I'm never going to be, like, a perfect singer. Mm -hmm. But I've kind of figured out where my voice lives best and that's what I hone in on. That's what I focus on. And I focus on my strengths in that sense. Yeah. And I think your sound, first of all, you are, you, you have released so many songs. I love it. You have such a beautiful, vast body of work Thank you. and your voice is so consistent Thanks. across all of it. Um, I really, I think you do lean into your strengths. You, you sound fantastic. It's and, a blessing and a curse yeah. because in some work environments, like if we're writing, because I don't always write just for myself, I write, I'll write for other artists. Yeah. And many times we're writing for, you know, another artist and I have to demo the song as I always do in the room. But because my voice is so specific, sometimes it doesn't always work in that favor because they're like, can you sound more like this? And I'll try. And I'm like, we can try. But I'm just telling you, sometimes it won't always work. And that's just, you know, that's how it is. I don't have one of those voices that... I can sound like a lot of different things and, but that's okay for me. (laughs) That's so fascinating because I'm the opposite. I have like a chameleon voice. Like I can, I can imitate really, really well, but my, my core voice is like all over the place. I (laughs) mean, it's, there's strengths and weaknesses to all of it. Yeah. I mean, mine's probably more helpful as an actor anyway, but. I mean, for what you do, it's probably a perfect situation. (laughs) Yeah. But, but I, so, so I really admire, like you have found this core sound. Um, yeah, I, I love it. Do you have any, um, tips for somebody who is trying to get a pop sound Mm -hmm. what makes your sound or the sound in the like area that you're in iconic to that area I grew up listening to uh Destiny's Child and TLC and Tracy Chapman Mariah Carey and those were always the kinds of voices that I wanted to sound like and I always just felt that I don't know why I love those voices um so I would you know, I would try and mimic the runs and, and their vibrato. And that's just naturally what I gravitated towards. 
So I, th- in my opinion, whatever you love listening to and whoever your role models are, listen to those people and learn from them because yeah. eventually that's, you know, who you're going to be inspired from. And mm-hmm. I feel like that's where your voice more stylistically will lean. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, all, I love all of those artists and they all have a slightly lighter, less like muscular mm-hmm. tone than I usually lean into. So maybe that's my next I step. Mean, listen, I love that. Just dive in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, so I, I'm interested in your first songwriting steps. Mm-hmm. How did that come about? So there was, uh, I had a coach, Ray Lyle. He lived in like the next city close to where I live. So I was like eight or nine, and I would take the city bus to him after school. And he he was a pop vocal coach, Mm -hmm. but it was really good to see him because he wasn't also like he did the artist thing and he was a writer. So I was able to kind of see music from that side of things, not just like strictly vocal training. Mm -hmm. He, He was the one that first helped me write my first song. So like he sat down at a piano and he would ask me, what do you want to write about today? Um, And I was going through, at that point, I was like 12, and we had some, you know, family issues going on, so that's what I chose to write about. So it was kind of a great way for me to get comfortable and, like, dip my toe in the water of writing songs, especially from personal experience. So he, and I was doing a lot of, like, poetry. I mean, I was, like, so young. I was, like, 10 years old. (laughs) I was writing these, like, crazy little poems in my diary. But he, yeah, he was the one that first helped me write, like, my first song. And that was kind of my first taste. And then eventually I kind of self-taught myself piano just off of, like, watching YouTube. And then I would just start writing songs eventually on my own. (gasps) Wow. When you write now, do you go from lyrics first or music first, or is it a mix? So it's a different now. There's so many different processes. Mm -hmm. Before, especially when I was really just trying to get more into the business, it was a lot of me independently writing. So me sitting in front of my piano by myself, trying to come up with like song ideas. Mm -hmm. But now that I'm, you know, I'm working at different pro working on different projects all the time I'm usually always in the room or working with a producer so depending on what it's for we'll usually start with the track first Mm -hmm. um because we kind of have an idea of directionally like where we want to go with the vibe we want up tempo what the bpm should be so we start with the track and then usually I'll start writing out melodies Mm -hmm. first I'll jump on the mic try and get some like melodies down for a chorus and then the lyrics take shape after that. So that's now that's mostly what the process is. But for example, yesterday I had a writing session and the writing session yesterday was for my own artist project. And so I knew it was going to kind of be like in the electronic dance realm. So I had the, I like the BPM in my head. Mm -hmm. So on the drive over there, I was coming up with certain lyric ideas So that was the process yesterday. So it just, it always depends on what we're writing for. I write a lot of film and TV songs um, to pitch. And those are also a very specific direction. And those usually, I try and have some concepts in my head Mm -hmm. before. But yeah, it's honestly, every song is totally different. So there's no one answer. (laughs) Yeah. I definitely want to come back to the yeah. film and TV side as yeah. well and the collaboration. A nerdy question. Mm-hmm. What kind of programs do you and your producers love to use the most or yeah. what microphones? Like from the tech side, if somebody like is a, a songwriter totally. or is already producing, mm-hmm. since you're in it and doing yes. this at the highest levels, what do you recommend? I feel very strongly about this. I love I, it. I, as a vocalist, so I have a, my studio at home. Mm-hmm. I record probably 70% of all my vocals that I release and put out there at home Mm -hmm. um, by myself. I use Logic. Mm -hmm. Um, I find as a vocalist, it's the easiest way to edit and comp your vocals. Great. Most of the producers I work with, they're either using Logic, Pro Tools, um, what's the other one? There's another one they use. I don't even know. But so it's a mix mash of different things. Mm-hmm. But a lot of them, whatever program they're using, they'll end up going back to Logic sometimes to record the vocals. Got it. So as a vocalist, from a vocalist perspective, I like Logic. Um, as far as equipment, there's two microphones I use. The Shure SM7B 
That's what Michael Jackson recorded his album Thriller on. It's this, like, it's not expensive. It's under a 1000 bucks. It's one of those microphones you can literally chuck it at the wall and it won't break. So yeah. it's nice to travel with. Oh. If I'm going, I would take it to Europe with me if I was going there for a writing trip. Because what's nice about it is I can literally just sit here and, like, record. I don't need, like, the shield around it necessarily. Wow. It's just super easy. You see a lot of people, like, when they're doing podcast recordings a lot of the times, if they're, like, just talking to a mic, it's that microphone. Mm -hmm. So it's super durable. Mm -hmm. But the quality is great. Um, so I'll use that when I'm traveling or if I have, like, a mobile setup session set up somewhere mm -hmm. in my home studio. Um, there's a few different mics that... Um, I use the Manly Cardioid mic is my ultimate favorite microphone. Okay. I was I had a few before that, and I was in a session, this was like five years ago, and the producer at the time, we were recording on the Manly. It's like a black and red microphone, and that's been my favorite one ever since. So that's hands down. I'll always see that, use that microphone. And then there's different, like interfaces and inputs that I use but basically microphone is kind of most important to yeah, me. yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> in your home studio do you have the do you have like shields or audio panels or how do you deal panels. with that it's a small room which is nice mm -hmm. because there's just less you know stuff to take care of on the wall so I have yeah. a bunch of panels I usually have a shield around my mic but sometimes I don't even use it just because I get lazy and, like, sometimes I'll want to sit and, like, bring the microphone back to me and, like, lean it back depending on the vibe of the song mm -hmm. just because if I'm, like, in a relaxed mood. So yeah. half the time I don't even use the shield, but I have the panels up. So okay. got it. Yeah. So that takes some of the yes, room back. totally. Out. I need that. You need that for sure. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and then coming back to the um, – especially pitching songs yeah. for TV and film, when you're writing those, are you writing for a specific show or mm -hmm. a specific network in mind yeah. to pitch to? Or is it, how, how does that process so, work? So there's two approaches. So when I first moved to LA, obviously I moved out here for music. I didn't even think about writing music for film and TV is like an avenue for me. Yeah. And as an artist, it's a great promotional tool. So like, a lot of my songs, I'll pitch them out to different agencies and music supervisors that I know because if it gets placed in a TV show, it's free advertising for me as an artist. Yeah. Um, and then on the other side of things, even songs that I'm not releasing or that aren't under my artist project, I'll, I'll get involved in certain projects. Um, so there's a couple different ways. Uh, most 90% of the songs I'm working on now are on, I would call them on spec. Basically, I own them all. I kind of have an idea of what the shows are looking for as, as far as my style of what normally gets placed from my catalog. And it's up-tempo, positive. They always want, like, good feeling, like, summer vibes, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I have that stuff ready, and I get briefs often. And so I kind of take note now of, like, the... I've noticed they're looking for a lot of stuff with the keyword togetherness. So instead of me trying, because in the beginning when I was still kind of like new to the to the writing game for film and TV, I'd be like, oh my God, this brief came in. They need a song about family in 24 hours. And then I would call up every producer I knew and I'm like, you guys, we have to scramble and do this, which it's fine. There's a chance you'll get it placed. But honestly, there's like a thousand people submitting for that. And the smarter way for me to do it is just, like, I should start, I should have 20 songs written in that vibe because that brief is going to come up again in a week. I already know it because I've yeah. seen it five times already. So now I just have, like, a catalog of probably a couple hundred songs now where it's just, like, different vibes about, you know, positivity and feeling good. And then I, every time I write those songs, I send them out to all my contacts and, Sometimes it'll take a year to get them placed. Sometimes it takes a month, but they're out there and they eventually mm. get placed. Mm. So it's a lot of that. And then I would say the smaller part of it is like I'll get called for a project. Like my friend was, he was the music supervisor for Criminal Minds mm -hmm. and they needed a cover of a certain song. He's like, hey, we need this in 24 hours. Can you do this for me? So I did that. Yeah. Um, similar things where they're like, we need a song about this, like this deadline in 24 hours. Can you do it? So then for those things, of course, I'll jump on. Yeah. Um, 
often with those, the upfront pay, because it's guaranteed, is it's gambling. It's not as much, yeah. but at least it's there and it's guaranteed, you know, it's going to come through. Yeah. Um, so I prefer, honestly, the ones where I can just, you know, I'll get, I'll go in the studio and be like, hey guys, like, we should write a song about this today. I have a feeling like they're going to be looking for this and then we can kind of get more creative with it. And then who knows in six months, maybe it'll yeah. be like payback and something happens with it. Yeah. So you're just like so, investing in your own creation and then all, trusting it's, it's going to work out. 99% of it is an upfront investment right. which, and, and then hopes something's going to come out of it. Yeah. Which I, I guess I'm a risky person. I love it. So yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah. And it's clearly like you have found a way to make it work yeah. in a sustainable enough way totally. to keep going, yes. which I think is the name of the game. And I think it's hard in the beginning because you haven't seen results yet. Yeah. So it's really hard to like put all of this effort and time into something where you're like, I don't know if this is going to happen. But then once you do and you see the first thing come in. It gives you that confidence, like, okay, it's it was working for this. <clears throat> if I do more, then the chances of more happening are going to be greater. So it yeah. kind of gives you that confidence just to keep to keep doing it. Yeah. And for me, I've I've completely let go of the outcome now. Like, I don't even care. And like, I'll go in. I'm like, you guys, honestly, I don't care if this gets placed or not. I'm just doing this because I love it right now. I, you know, I feel great about the song. I'm happy in this moment. I've learned to just really let go of whatever happens to it. And I've enjoyed the process way more. And I do feel like because I'm less attached to what happens with it, more just naturally comes. Yeah. Um, which has been a, like a great learning experience for me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I feel like that's true. And still when you're in the moment, it's not always the easiest to totally. let go of it. Yeah. But I, I completely agree. Yeah. There's like the idea of um creating something because you see where things are mm -hmm. going so it's not like from nothing but yeah. it is from like a knowingness of where we're headed totally. it's very calculated yeah and it's very instinctual and yeah. I love that like sense of pairing the creative with the business yes, yes. aspect there is a lot of that so yeah um and like a lot of people I work with I find I'm you know, there's people take on different roles yeah. and I feel like I kind of naturally, I'm very actively now, especially in the last year, I've been super empowered in building up my contacts and who mm -hmm. I know. And I, if I really love the feeling of that, of having more control. Yeah. So I've taken on kind of like with people I work with, I'm the one that's sending the stuff out. It's my contacts that I'm trying to go for, which is great for me because I love that kind of leadership. Yeah. Um, but it's also more pressure. Like then now I feel this obligation, like if stuff doesn't get placed, I feel like it's my fault. So there is that, like, I really, really want this to work. Not even for me, but just because like, I know my two friends over here who like hustled to get this song done with me and he like produced it amazingly and it sounds amazing I wanted to get placed now yeah so it was like about a year ago I you know we all have like these different points in our career but I decided I really want to try and build up who I know and my list of contacts even more yeah um because I was doing a lot of placements through different agencies and part of me was like I also like whoever those agencies know, like, how do I get to those people? So, yeah, because these agencies, they're working with 15 artists mm -hmm. and I'm going to send this agency 10 songs. The artist next to me is also sending them 10 songs. Mm -hmm. So out of my 10 songs, that agency is probably sending one person to their one to their contact. Right. Yeah. So I want to just try and get more contacts so I have more direct access. So yeah. I started really focusing on my networking abilities and who I know. And um, I went to New York a few weeks ago for a sync conference just to b meet more people. Mm -hmm. I'm going to one in two weeks. So it's a lot of like time invested, but I think it's so worth it. And yeah. as a creator, you know, like we can't sit back and rely on other people to do stuff for us anymore. Yeah. We really have to take ownership in and the outcome of what we want. So that's really what I focus on this year, which has been fun. That's so motivating and inspiring. Yeah. I love Thanks. it. Are you ready to be confident and comfortable in front of a camera? Well, my name is Jessica Payne and I would love to help you. I'm an actor, acting coach, and the host of the Creators Cafe video podcast. I have helped 
thousands of people to learn the skills of a Hollywood actor to be more comfortable in their body, voice, and mindset whenever you press record. So if you're an entrepreneur, a business person who needs to be in front of the camera, or you want to get into digital content creation, I would love to offer you one-on-one on-camera performance coaching so that you feel like when you press record, you can be your best self. Check out the link below for more details. And I can't wait to work with you. Let's have fun together. So when you're writing for mm-hmm. film and TV, are you releasing those as part of mm-hmm. your like releases in your streams or is that in the vault? How does yeah, that work? That's a good question. So the I there's so much content and volume that I write for film and TV projects. And I do find stylistically it happens to usually be a different than the stuff I'm releasing under my artist project. So for that reason, I'm not usually releasing them unless it happens that that style is kind of more leaning towards who I am as an artist. And if it's like, okay, guys, we got it placed in this project. It's coming out in three weeks. Then I'll put a release together for it because it's kind of nice sometimes riding on that wave of like, it's coming out in the show. We can use it for promotion then I'll kind of line up a release around it. But for the most part, no, it's not usually getting released unless it's like a special kind of situation. What releases were you most excited about for the film and TV stuff? Mm -hmm. What or, you know, maybe there's like a a guilty pleasure show or one that you were really excited about. Well, when I first started writing, well, so like (laughs) I was always obsessed with the show Selling Sunset. Yeah. And the... I wasn't really doing a lot of, like, writing for film and TV um, or, like, actively really trying to pursue it. I was getting some placements, but just, like, off of random songs that, like, whatever. Um, I wasn't even, like, trying to really write for that. So once I started honing into, like, this is something I want to focus on because I I love it. it. It's a great exercise for me as a writer and, like, it's fun. I would, like, figure out what my favorite shows are, and I would listen to all of the songs in those TV shows. So Selling Sunset was one of them, because they always, they had so many songs that they were placing in each episode, and stylistically, the songs kind of aligned with what I did. So um, I kind of just, one of my producers and I, we, like, got together, we made a playlist of all the songs, and we just, like, got inspired, wrote a bunch of songs, I reached out to the music supervisor of that show, and then the next season they placed, like, five of our songs. <laughs> That's so incredible. I yeah. love that. You so were just that like, was fun, because it was, like, a first, yeah. like, we're going to, like, spend a bunch of time, and, like, who knows what's going to happen, but I reached out his, yeah, I found him on, well, I reached out to him on Facebook, um, yeah, and that's how it happened. <laughs> I love it. I yeah. love it. So for most of your placements, mm-hmm. you had mentioned agencies. Are there yeah. agencies you work with or online? I know there's like yeah, sites that you can match up with. So the sites, how does that work? I don't usually use the sites because I feel, um, I tried in the beginning, but I just feel like it's a lot harder because there's so like when there's a site like that there's just so many people uploading whereas at least if you can find an agency obviously it's a lot more curated Mm -hmm. but of course to get in with an agency it's harder because they're gonna there's a lot more hoops you have to jump through and like they're very specific as far as the sounds they want and who they want to work with so I work with different agencies and basically they're the middlemen between the artists slash writers and the actual, like, people who are placing the songs in the TV show. So mm-hmm. they're kind of just, like, sync reps, they also call them. And they yeah. just have different artists that they work with. And then they'll go out, um, send out the songs to different projects that are looking, and they take their cut. So there's that avenue. So there's a bunch of sync agencies that I work with in that sense. Got it. And then when you can, it's better if you can go directly to the actual show Um, and those are like, those, like most of the shows have like a music supervisor that they Mm -hmm. hire, but they're really hard to get to. Yeah. So it's great if you have those contacts and there's a couple people that I know and, you know, we've gotten placements through that way. That's ideal, but, Mm -hmm. um, that's a lot more difficult. Yeah. It's interesting because, uh, in the acting world, you only have one agent that Uh you work with most of the time. You could work freelance, but it's pretty rare. Yeah. Um, but 
that's kind of equivalent to an actor getting themselves yeah. in front of a casting director yeah. is, is yeah. You, you can't reach out to them directly it's, most it's of the time. Unless you have like some weird <sighs> contact and they're yeah. your friend. It's yeah. the same thing. But when you do, they, they're they the decision yeah. makers. So that's kind of like so exactly the what you same want. process, mm. except like the difference is with what you're talking about. The reason why you only have one agency is because they're representing you, right? Yeah. It's, it's just you as a whole. And obviously you can't like duplicate yourself five yeah. times and have different agencies for all of you. Whereas with music, it's songs. So yeah. like there are certain sync agencies that work exclusively, meaning they don't want anyone else working like certain songs. Mm-hmm. Um, I prefer not to work with those situations because sometimes I find like they'll just sign songs exclusively and then they don't do anything with them. Yeah. Whereas I'm like, I want to still have control of of my song. So there are certain situations if I know the agency where they're actually working really hard, but, um, yeah, most of the time I try and work with non-exclusive agencies. That way I can still send it out to different people, but yeah, it's a very similar thing. It's just, they're representing songs instead of like you as an actor, right? Great. I love that explanation. Thank you. Um, Mm -hmm. If you place a song on Selling Sunset, is that song like, does it have exclusive rights for Selling Sunset or you just placed it, they licensed it? that's the beautiful thing about it. Oh, that's so so good. Okay. um, There are specific cases, like if it's a massive ad campaign for like Chevy, they'll be like, and this is rare, um, but if it's a massive, massive budget, massive brand, they're like, you can't place the song using with another car company. Got it. Okay. Um, so there are certain situations like that, but 99% of the time, what's great about it is if this show places my song, they're paying for the permission to use it. Yeah. They're not owning or controlling anything. I retain 100% control of all of it. I'm just giving them for a price. Yeah. They get to use it for this 30 second spot in this scene and that's it. Yeah. And then the songwriters of the song, me and whoever I was working on it with, will collect the back end royalties. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we can get that song placed over and over again. And the nice thing is it's usually like, you know, we'll write a hundred songs, let's say, and I have a hundred songs out there that I've sent to different people And it's always, like, the five that get placed over and over again. So Mm -hmm. I feel like it's a bit of a snowball effect with specific songs. Like, Mm -hmm. if it gets placed in this show, I find that it's, like, those moneymaker songs that just get placed over and over and over again. Yeah. And you never know which songs those are going to be. And I'm (laughs) like, I don't know why this one out of all these ones is the one. But that's why you, like... I always say you have to write a hundred songs to get that one magic one and you don't know what it's going to be, but you have to have written those hundred ones to get there, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Ooh, I love that. That's what's nice about it. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So moving on from the TV film world, what about for you artistically Mm -hmm. from your artist project, what are the songs or the projects that you're the most proud of or excited about that are coming up? So... In the last year, um, I have really been writing a lot of songs in like the pop electronic space. Mm -hmm. So there are different labels that I've been doing just like singles deals with, um, a lot of them in Europe, um, just because that kind of music works really well there. Mm -hmm. Um, So I've been like in the last year, I've been working a lot to try and build up like a good group of songs that I can continuously release for Mm -hmm. like this calendar year and the next calendar year so there's like a song coming out every like four weeks which I'm really excited about oh wow um so I just not too long ago like put out a song um with this artist Marco Nobel who's a DJ so we did a song together and um for the upcoming collaborations there's another DJ we're still working out the details but in four weeks I think that song's coming out. I can't say who it is yet, but yeah. Um, so there's just different, you know, artists like that. But mm-hmm. most of the ones is just me as my own artist, which is kind of fun because mm-hmm. it's just my solo project. And there's different labels that I've been working with, which is really nice having that support. Yeah, it kind of takes the pressure off of me because before I was doing a lot of like independent releases, so yeah. like I'm dealing with everything. So now I'm at a point where. The labels are helping out, which is really nice. And it's mm-hmm. it allows me to just focus on, like, the writing and the creation. 
So at the end of this month, there's a song coming out, which I'm really excited about. Um, and yeah, just a bunch of stuff for the rest of the year. So yeah. Oh, that's fun. excellent. Yeah. Where did your collaborations come about for your work for the song Slow Mo? Because yeah. that's the one that made it to Eurovision yeah. and placed in the top three. Yeah. And I I really love the song. It's Thanks. so fun. Thank you. Um, and I, I encourage people to watch the music Thanks. video. That one was like, it's so crazy because everything that happened with that song, like, you know, if I could do it a thousand times over and over again, I would love that. And it's just all of these random events had to happen for for it to get to get that outcome we had originally we wrote it on zoom during covid um one of my producers sent me a track i got on zoom with two friends because we were writing it originally for someone else and it was like going to be a spanglish song Mm -hmm. i don't speak spanish so um we got on zoom i was helping with the melodies and certain of like certain parts of the English speaking parts of the song. They were helping out with the Spanish stuff. Long story short, we loved the song, how it turned out. The artist we originally had written for, um, I don't even know if she ended up hearing it. Who knows? It didn't work out. And then our friend Leroy said, you know, he sent it over to Eurovision Spain. And there's this artist, Chanel. She heard the song and she loves it. She hasn't really released anything on her own yet, but she's super talented. Would you guys be open to, like, letting her record it and release it? Yeah. So we looked her up. And at the time, I'm like, you know, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) It's hard to say. Yeah. Because every song, like, especially, like, special ones like that, we knew was a special one. It was Mm -hmm. so precious for us. Mm Mm-hmm. So it's a risk sometimes giving it to an artist who hasn't really put out a lot of stuff before because you you just don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. And we don't know if she's really going to, like, work it or whatever. So she ended up recording a demo of it. And she sounded amazing on it. Yeah. So she, we're like, okay, she can, she'll, she can record it and, um, and do what she wants with it. So she ended up going to, it's called Benny Dorm Fest. So every country in Eurovision has their own internal countries contest Mm -hmm. and that's how they pick who which artist is gonna represent and go on to eurovision so like a lot of the countries kind of do that so Mm -hmm. for spain it's benadorm fest okay she performed slow-mo competed against a ton of other artists in spain and then she ended up winning which meant that she was gonna be the artist to represent spain in eurovision so that was already like a hoop we had to jump through and like we don't know because it's so everyone's so talented and like we don't know who's gonna get picked yeah so she won which was great Then, um, even before Eurovision aired, she's an amazing dancer and she started posting videos of like her singing and all these things. So it started going viral online already before Eurovision, which was great, like pre-promotion for the song. Because once she performed it on Eurovision, I mean, I don't even know, tens of, so so many, tens of millions of people watch Eurovision. So like, it's just a huge audience. She performed, and then basically the song became a hit. Yeah. Um, went number one in Spain. It was just, it was like her first song, breakthrough artist song. So there was just so many, like, different random things that had to happen. And, like, I know I, having a song in Eurovision was never something I was ever going to predict for that song. Especially, sure. like, as a writer, because... I know so many friends in Europe, they'll do, like, every year they'll go to writing camps to try and write for Eurovision. And they'll, like, work all year to get songs to get placed in Eurovision. And, like, this literally happened without us even trying. So it's just so bizarre to me. <laughs> that happens sometimes. It's yeah. like, you just don't know what song it's going to be. Yeah. And maybe that's why it works so well, because it was so unpredictable. And, like, yeah. stylistically, a song like that and a performance like that was very... Um, like it, it just wasn't really done before. So yeah. I think it took a lot of people by surprise, which is why it worked so well. Yeah. So it was kind of just one of those magical songs. And like, we always knew we loved it, but it, there's, you know, there's a lot of songs we love and sadly, sometimes things don't happen with them. Yeah. But yeah, we lucked out with that one. A lot of like universe luck, you know, stars had to align for that to happen. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And definitely I think it must come from that, you know, create the yeah. 100 things and put them all out you just, there totally and, and you just don't know and it was literally yeah. during covid we were on freaking zoom writing yeah. a song and we're like 
you know, we're half, half the time we're just joking around. It's like, <laughs> who knows? Yeah. But, and that was the one. So that was the first number one, like billboard number one platinum song that I got as a wow. writer, which was super exciting. So like getting the plaque and all of that was amazing and it was just I don't know I'm just like it's just like every other song I wrote you just don't know which one's gonna be it <laughs> yeah I, I'm yeah. sure it's that like attention to detail and focus and yes. passion and then letting it go totally letting go I'm like yeah. whatever who cares it doesn't matter the yeah. universe will take care yeah. of it so oh uh, wow um is that what led you to working with the k-pop group completely separate it's like totally separate. that okay. was like totally random again I was like it, I was I was like eight and a half months pregnant. I get this email from one of the publishing companies in Sweden that I know, and they send me this track. And they're like, hey, there's like this K-pop group called The Seraphim, and they're working on an album. They were kind of new at the time. Nobody really heard of them. And I hit up my friend. I'm like, hey, like, you know what? I don't know. Do you want to get together today? And like, we could just write to this track. I don't know. It was so random. And I happened to be free that day when the publishing company hit me up. So it was kind of just good timing. And um, I'm like, I don't know. I'm just sitting around pregnant. I have nothing else to do. <laughs> so because um, I wasn't traveling. I yeah. was in town. Yeah. So we did it. We sent it off like we do with, you know, every other song we do. And then a few months later, they sent me an email saying the song is making it onto their album. And then there was an EP. Mm -hmm. The EP came out. EP went number one. Like, they blew up. It was just one of those, like, by chance things. And so it's, I don't know. It was one of those things. I mean, you just, but also, like, you were in the right place in the right time. And you'd position yourself. And, like, and the opportunity was there. I could have, you know, I, I feel like so many, I see it a lot with people where they're, like, they're so attached to the outcome mm-hmm. where it ends up hindering, you know, a lot of opportunities for them. Like, yeah, this, you know, they just sent me the track. In my mind, I'm like, probably nothing's going to happen with it. But I'd rather work than, you know, sit at home and like watch TV for like yeah. four hours. Like, it's just I feel like so many times people pass up opportunities because they don't have faith that something could happen with it. Mm-hmm. And honestly, <clears throat> yeah, the odds are stacked against us. Like, mm-hmm. most of the time, unfortunately, <laughs> nothing's going to happen. But I feel like if you love it enough, that is, should be the thing that drives you. Because it was so fun writing that song. Like, I got to hang out with a friend. We got to write. We felt hella productive that day. And I had zero expectations for it. But because we did it and because we ended up, like, you know, choosing to spend our four hours like like that... Um, the payoff was amazing and Mm. I'm so glad we did. So yeah, it was just one of those things. The opportunity was there and we jumped on it and we said, yes. Yeah. I love it. So yeah. yeah. How do you pick the Mm -hmm. people that you choose to work with? That's a really good question. Or again and again. Um, that's cause I'm super particular now with, Mm -hmm. I say, you know, it's, I'm saying like, yeah, say yes and just do it. But I also have learned when to say yes, and I think it takes experience and intuition and, like, listening to your gut to know the opportunities that are not worth it. Yeah. Um, And there are certain opportunities that I will just say no to just because the vibe is off or Mm -hmm. even, like, even if I'm, like, something could could come out of it, but, like, I know this sounds crazy, energetically, I don't feel good about it. I'll just say no because it's I would rather spend my time doing like I would rather spend my time sitting at home writing a song by myself and that's it. So um, now I'm just at a place where I just don't want a, I don't want anyone to waste my time. So everyone else has to take it hella seriously. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I want everyone else to be hustling at like fucking 100 percent all mm-hmm. the time mm-hmm. because I take this seriously. This is my life. So I want to make sure whoever I'm spending my time with and working, they have to take it at that same level. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's also just like after doing this for so long, there's certain people that I've worked with that I know their track record and is good and I can trust them. So it's kind of nice and easy where I know like when that company sends me an email, I know it's going to get heard. So it makes me feel more confident that like, yeah, at least the chances are there. Um, and also people that just treat you with respect. Like there's a lot of companies that will reach out. And they want to work together, but their terms are horrible. And I'm like, 
whoever was going to sign this has no respect for themselves. So, like, mm-hmm. and clearly you don't have respect for a writer if you think that you can, like, keep 100% of our publishing for nothing. Ooh. So it's just yeah. those those kind of things that you kind of learn. But it's, it's so hard in the beginning because you do want to, like, jump on every single opportunity. And I think there is something to be said. Like, yeah, you have to do that. You have to make mistakes. You have to get burned. You have to get screwed over a lot in order for you to kind of start to be able to recognize the opportunities that are worth taking. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. Do you wind up working with the same producers yes. a lot of the time? Yeah. Okay. There's like probably like 10 people now that I love, that I work with, mm-hmm. and we have the same goals. And like stylistically, you know, we work well together. I'm always trying to re- meet new people and find mm-hmm. new people to work with. But it's hard. Like, it's really hard to find people that you align with and mm-hmm. who um, who just want to do this because they love it and who work hard. And Yeah. Um, yeah. So it is hard to find. I'm always open to it, but I just find myself now... There's a very specific people circle of people that I will work with now. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. How does it work when you're choosing to work with a team? Mm-hmm. It's very different. Like, it's so different than a, a typical nine to five job yeah. where you go in and you work for a company and totally. they pay you. How does that kind of process work, mm-hmm. especially if you're working on something that's like a sync or yeah. on spec? Um, is that just something that you and the producers like come to terms yeah. with before you start, put the work in, totally. put it out there, and then see what happens? How That's does that work? That's a good question. So, you know, it's, yeah, it's an investment of time for everyone. Yeah. 90, it's 90% of the time. So, like, um, for a lot of the sing songs, everyone walking into the room knows, you know, we're not, it's a gamble. We're going to write a song, we're going to put the time in, and hopefully something happens out of it. Yeah. Uh, especially, so it's for sync. For artist stuff, if we're writing on spec for other artists, like yeah. if we know this artist needs songs, we'll write a song for her. Mm-hmm. For my own artist project, and we'll kind of have an idea before we walk into the session what we're doing that day. Mm-hmm. We always kind of have a goal in mind. If it's for an artist project for myself, um, if the song ends up getting released, then of course, like the producer, whoever produced it, they'll end up being involved on the master or whatever. There's certain situations. But, you know, it's always kind of just we're working on who, whatever is going to happen with the song. And it's yeah. so hard to know because you, you don't know, know exactly what you're going to write that day. And sometimes it, it ends up being an amazing song. Sometimes yeah. it ends up being okay. And, like, yeah. maybe it might not get used for something. Um, so, yeah, most of the time it's just... Um, it's just kind of doing it in hopes Mm -hmm. that something good is going to happen. Um, there are certain situations where, you know, artists will hire us to go in and write, um, and it's a hood up front fee and we'll do that. Um, to be honest, I don't love doing that. I don't know why. (laughs) It's just, if it's for a specific thing, it's okay, but I kind of like, I don't know. I guess I'd like the gamble. <laughs> well, and I think it feels a little more, I, I think some artists yeah. prefer kind of commission-based work and yeah. some prefer the personal thing totally. and just make it what you love. Yeah. And then if it picks up, it resonates. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. So that makes sense to me. There's different ways to do it. And like, yeah. obviously certain projects for film and TV, those will be um, commission-based where yeah. they'll commission us to do it sure. up front. And those happen sometimes, too, and that's fine. I like doing those, um, but most of the time it's just going in and being a bit more free. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I love that freedom. Okay, so I always ask my guests for a creator's challenge that my listeners could do in 10 minutes okay. with whatever they have. Love what would this. you suggest? So when I first moved to L.A., I didn't know anyone, so I was like trying to stay busy and I was just trying to like meet people and like keep my day full yeah so I committed to writing I think it was like one to two songs every day just by myself it didn't have to be a full song it had to be at least a chorus Uh uh-huh so I would say a good challenge for anyone who's you know into writing or singing or music and it's a great exercise write at least a chorus give yourself literally like 10 minutes yeah and it can be horrible but as long as you just get a chorus it's such a good exercise to just not have to overthink everything and i was talking with one of my producers about it before because yeah like obviously the quality 
when you're actually writing for stuff and pitching it, the quality has to be amazing, right? Mm -hmm. But there's also, it's such a numbers game. So the quantity, you also have to have so many songs. And, like, it's just the more songs you have, the more chances of certain songs, something's going to happen with them. He said quantity over quality leads to quality over quantity. Because the more you do the more exercise you're giving yourself and the better you get at it, which then leads to quality. So I thought that was so brilliant and and I love that. So yeah, the more you do, the better you get at it and it'll eventually lead to like more amazing things later on. That's such a cool way to think about that yeah. because they, they both were aiming for both of yeah, them, honestly. Totally. But doing quantity first to get yeah. to quality makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah. So I think it's a good exercise. So just yeah. take 10 minutes and write the fastest song ever. I love it. I love yeah. it. That's brilliant. Yeah. Um, where can people find you? My website is maggiezabo.com okay. and social media, Twitter. I mean, X now, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, official Maggie Zabo. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. And I'll have that in the show notes. Great. You are fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Thanks Maggie. Thanks so much for having me. This is so fun. Yeah, cheers. Cheers. Cheers to another week. In yeah. yeah. <laughs> Join the community and share your creative challenges on Instagram and Facebook at Creators Cafe by Kika Labs. And also check out my website, kikalabs.com, K-I-K-A-L-A-B-S.com to sign up for the mailing list so you always know when a new podcast is released and to check out my coaching and digital courses to help you be a more confident and joyful creator.